Hello everyone, my name is Joshua Weiner. I'm here with Taylor from Seppi Solar. We're here to talk about Rule 21, why it's important, why should you care, what's involved, common pain points, lessons learned. I'm really excited to be meeting with Taylor because um, you know Taylor's been an engineer with us for how long? Uh, just about three years, a little over. Awesome, and in that time you've been doing design and engineering on, on various systems, right? Absolutely, uh, came in, started doing residential and uh, quickly kind of moved into the commercial world and have been there ever since. Awesome, and only just a couple of weeks ago you gave this awesome presentation internally at Seppi Solar about Rule 21 and how it's important. And I, I just loved what you presented and I, I want us to be able to share it with our audience here because I feel like Rule 21 is this rule that governs almost all of our lives in some form or fashion, us being solar guys or storage guys or microgrids. We're interconnecting these systems into the utility grid on a regular basis. And um, I don't know that many people have actually read it. I mean, before this, had you read Rule 21 or? No, I, you know, I hadn't actually dug through it with a fine tooth comb. It's about uh, a little over 250 page document. So it's definitely a, wow. a significant read, but you know, it's one of those uh, you know, documents that pretty much governs every single system we're, we're putting into place here in, in California. So uh, it obviously has a, a large impact on, on everything we do on a day-to-day -day basis. I gotta ask, how long did it take you to get through the 250 pages of Rule 21? And, you know, taking notes and kind of getting everything, uh, you know, together took uh, probably about a week of, of solid wow. reading and, and kind of organizing and making sure I understood all the all the legalese that is kind of uh, yeah. the governing style of the document. Yeah, I remember your your summary of the 250 pages was itself like a 50 slide PowerPoint deck. Does that sound about right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was yeah. definitely a. Yeah. Significant, significant PowerPoint. So, so let me just ask. Um, I mean, why should we care about Rule Twenty One, or who should, who should care, and why should they care? You know, I think pretty much everyone who touches the solar industry uh, really has a, a vested stake in what Rule Twenty One has to say. Whether or not you're a uh, you know financer or a uh, contractor trying to construct one of these systems, at the end of the day, your goal is to get permission to operate from the utility so that you can cycle your system and, and you know start. Uh, you know, making value for your clients, and if you're uh, the person that's installing the system, you obviously want to get it uh, ready to go as soon as possible so that you can start realizing the value that uh, is available to you through solar energy. Got it. And Rule 21, just for definition's sake, that it governs pretty much any generator that you needs to interact or interoperate with the utility grid, right? So this is, Rule 21 doesn't just cover solar, it covers... Uh, uh, tidal and hydros and fuel cells, things like that, right? Absolutely. Pretty much any generating technology that's available on the market, kind of, uh, you know, Rule 21 itself is, is all about interconnections to the grid uh, yeah. under the context of generation. Got it. Um, and and what would you what prompted you to even go down this path and explore Rule Twenty One to begin with? I mean, what what uh, was there something specific that happened either internally with Seppi Solar or from a something you experienced outside that prompted you to go and research this and report it? You know, I I think that uh, engineering kind of has such an integral piece to play uh, with regards to the both the interconnection process, but also you know creating the systems as a whole. And it felt like a good time to be able to. Uh, you know, pull together our engineering expertise and use that uh, to leverage the ability of our clients to be able to get interconnection uh, completed in as expeditious a manner as possible while making sure that you know everything is correct and, and complete and uh, ready to go so that systems can operate as quickly as possible. Yeah. And my, I mean, to that, ex to that point, as quickly as possible, I mean, my experience of, lear of hearing you speak about Rule 21 was that it, it didn't feel like a very quick process at all. It's, I mean, it's 250 pages for a reason. I mean, there's a lot of processes and sub-processes, and I feel like you need, like, this tree branch chart that, sh you know, if A, then B, and can you, can you talk a little about, um, like, just... Is Rule 21 simple or complex? And if complex, how and why is it so complicated? Absolutely. And I, I would say it's very complex. And there's kind of a lot of different, as you were alluding to, a lot of different avenues that projects can take depending on sizes, engineering constraints, and, and things on the utility side that can affect the systems. Uh, so it's very uh, kind of important to uh, kind of delve into it and, and understand how the choices that you're making with your projects can influence the system. And I think, uh, especially given the context of moving quickly, it's really important to uh, essentially start this process and, and get yourself into the, the engineering queue for the utility as quickly as possible so that you can kind of parallel as many of the processes that you have to do at the same time in order to get a system interconnected 
uh, and make sure that you're working as efficiently as possible, both for your own internal uh, business as well as for your downstream clients. So that's the, is that the bottleneck, like just getting submitted, like getting into the process so you can start going down these, you know, this cascade of various steps and reviews that you have to go through to get any kind of interconnection approved? Like, Absolutely. Uh, so there's, there's something called the queue that the utility maintains, uh, which is kind of a really important piece of the puzzle that, that people often overlook and have been known to miss. You know, a lot of people kind of think that submitting an application is starting the process when in fact, if you're not submitting an application that's complete and valid, you can add up to 20 to 25 days onto the, uh, the entire process wow. of getting interconnection. Okay, so I know we get this a lot at Cephe Solar. People are like, here's my utility bills. Here's the information you need. Get it submitted right away, quick, fast, fast, fast. Is that, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. We're always in a hurry to get things going as quickly as possible. But what's, what's the problem with that, I guess? What could go wrong if you go too quickly, I guess? Absolutely. So, so the utility... Uh, explicitly within Rule 21 puts a premium on making sure that your information is complete and accurate the first time. So if you're submitting an application, the utility's got 10 days to review the information. And if they deem that you've submitted everything correctly and your application is complete, then you get put into the queue at the day that you submit it. If you don't have everything complete and valid, they get that whole day, 10 day period to respond. Then you have to furnish the additional information. Then there's another 10 day period for them to review. And then at that point, when they decide that you're, uh, you're all set to go, you get placed in the queue when they make that decision. So wow. there's at least 20 days there of flex time and generally more if you need to gather information. So you just hit on a really interesting point. By submitting the information correctly the first time, you actually get a reactive or a, a retroactive submission date, the date you originally submitted. But if you have an error or a mistake or a gap and you now have to begin a back and forth with the utility, you don't get that date you submitted. You get some future date, whatever the utility decides. Exactly. And especially in, in, high, uh, in areas that have a high crowding of solar technologies, um, you know, that 20-day, that 25-day 20 period, there could be a lot of projects that get submitted in the same area, which could trigger downstream upgrades. So if you're unlucky enough to be on the, the wrong end of that, you could be the system that ends up having to trigger the upgrades, and you could have to wait a month, two months, six months, uh, depending on how long it takes the utility to actually install the upgrades. So it's, it's really uh -huh. important that you lock down that queue position by making sure that you submit completely uh, the first time you, you submit. And if I were to ask, like, what do you think are the biggest mistakes you've seen our clients or contractors and EPCs developers make um, throughout the Rule 21 process, whether it's initial submission or something um, along, the, along the journey, what would you say is like the biggest issue, mistake, problem, pain point that you've seen arise in the whole process? Yeah, I mean, I think kind of going back to what I said a little bit earlier, I think the, the big pain point is that submitting isn't starting, uh, despite kind of the common knowledge in the, uh, in the industry. And it's really important that if you, know, you make sure you're, you're submitting everything completely and cleanly on the first submittal, otherwise you can lose lots of time and potentially open yourself up to significant risks that could increase downstream timelines quite considerably. Got it. So tell me if I got this right. I mean, I feel like Rule 21 is all, like you said, it applies to any generator that interconnects or interoperates in parallel with the utility grid, which to me sounds like, you know, the utility company is reasonably so, trying to manage the power coming onto their grid. I mean, that's what generators do. They inject power over time. And Rule 21 strives to um, define that and characterize it and run it through a bunch of engineering and administrative checks to make sure that the utility companies can indeed oper continue to operate their grid even after you've interconnected with it for everybody's enjoyment. Um, so it feels like a big power management exercise. Is that a, do you think that's a fair way to characterize like uh, the, I guess the, the purpose of Rule 21? To put it really simply, it's about managing all the power which could be coming from top down, big, huge generators on one end of the grid or bottom up from a single residential homeowner on the completely opposite side of the grid. Absolutely. I mean, it's all about power management at the end of the day. And kind of there's two big factors that really kind of come into that. And that's first, you know, obviously making sure that it's safe and that there's not going to be any issues that could cause people to get hurt. At like, any UL, point like UL ratings and stuff like that. Exactly. UL, listing. okay. uh, UL listings, but also things on the engineering side just to make sure that people won't be working on energized lines or kind of other considerations that 
uh, you know, could cause issues for line workers or, or people operating the electrical equipment on the grid. Uh, and then the other, as you said, power management. The utility is governed by a lot of different rules. Rule 21 is, is just one of them. Uh, and, you know, rule three for new services, there's a, uh, you know, a lot of requirements for the level and uh, arrangement of the power that the utility gives you, the voltage uh, that they have to remain within, uh, and things of that nature. So they need to make sure that they're still able to meet all of their uh, legal uh, obligations, even with the addition of solar or any other generator that you're trying to interconnect to the grid. Got it. I, I get really excited about this in the context of storage, which CEPI Solar we obviously do a lot of, because if the, if, if the purpose of Rule 21 and the challenge we're all having is managing power on the grid, then storage to me feels like this incredible engine, this incredible tool to help mitigate the power impact on the grid while still being able to provide all the energy needs that the host facility or the end use customer actually needs. And we, we actually go and define this through a white paper that we have up on our website at cepisolar.com about NEM for storage, where we actually earlier this year, earlier in January of 2019, we actually um, pioneered the first policy that that allocates NEM credits for energy discharge from a storage system precisely because it helps to manage power impact on the grid and for a variety of other reasons. Um, well, this has been great. Taylor, thanks so much for your time and for talking to us about this. Um, yeah, Rule 21 is super exciting. Um, for those of you out there, uh, please visit us at cepisolar.com. Subscribe to our LinkedIn feeds and our Twitter feeds, as well as um, subscribe to our CNI Project newsletter. And we'll look forward to having more conversations like these, um, be they technical, administrative, and further discussions uh, in, in part of this video series. Thanks so much for joining us.